there, me, Michael, like in your friendly neighborhood, humble stroke assaulter. So the video you sh saw yesterday on Tuesday would be outside my normal uploading schedule. Uh, that's because someone said something ridiculous on the, you know, the interstupids. Um, when there is an occasion for me to rant, I may do so. Um, I don't normally do that, so they do happen occasionally. But we're back on to another Rudy Wednesday. Today's Rudy Wednesday is uploading a little bit later in the day, and I apologize for that. I've been... Are you done? So, crashes is yet to decide if he's staying or going. He doesn't know yet. That's okay. He has the brain half the size of a peanut, so he's, you know... Squirrel! So, today we're going to discuss, again, um, more about communication disorders, uh, be that anomia, be that aphasia. Specifically more to aphasia this time, uh, and, and mental health issues that... Um, the communication deficits you have after a stroke can create in the people around you. Again, um, aphasia as a, a third party disease or disorder as it will. So I'm the one with the aphasia or anomia or apraxia or fill in the blank combinations they're in and how that can impact the people around me. Now I'm going to leave the links down below of the academic documents that I found, like any research video I do, so you can see where I'm getting the information from. So some studies have indicated that caregivers, there's a level of burden and strain that's associated with having a stroke. And again, the more severe the stroke, uh, the more the strain could be. Uh, if you're not a very high paying job, again, that comes around again. Um, the caregiver's health, both uh, before the stroke and how it's impacted by the stroke, uh, meaning like how many hours of uh, do you have to provide care, how intensive is that care? Um, that then leads to some social isolation, so your your social network may become smaller because of that. However, there isn't a lot of research done about this, and what research has been done has been mainly in the last ten ish years. So, depending on where you are in the world will depend on how much research has been done and, and how much they are, they meaning the healthcare practitioners around you, how knowledgeable they are about this. So people that are caring for you, they can experience um, an occupational loss. Uh, they can have um, low demand for leisure or social activities, uh, mainly because they feel like they don't want to go out. Like, I can't leave him at home or her at home because, you know, how will they survive? So, kind of like parents, when you have to go out and, you know, you're wondering how your children are going to survive down in the basement with Doritos, Pepsi, and the PlayStation. You know, God forbid they need to cook anything. Hold on one second. Are you done? I'm kind of chatty tonight. So, you're, you're worried about, like, if I leave my loved one at home or... In some cases, do I always need to take them with me? Like, no matter what I do, like, do I need to take them when I go get my hair done? Do I need to take them every time I go shopping? Do I need to take them, you know, when I go do the things? So, some of the um, other issues that come around are um, finding that new equ equilibrium uh, after the stroke, specifically if the there's massive deficits specifically in the, in the realm of communication uh, because if you're not able to have an effective communication uh, using language with one person in, in any direction, be that incoming, outgoing, or God forbid both, that's going to place a new set of strain on the relationship and a, a new set of um, challenges. So then you get what type of barriers, um, how much participation, uh, what type of um, uncertainties and other obligations you're going to have. So then you get into the other bit of the spouse, your significant other that you live with and share life with. What type of support are they going to be able to get and receive? Um, be that this form of like respite care, so to speak, or relief care for themselves. Um, how they perceive their need to help their partner communicate um, various things, uh, such as how close you are to others. Um, you know, are there barriers that are organizational? So you might have a certain type of communication deficit that might not have 
so to speak, coverage in your area. So you now have to go looking outside your county, your region um, to, to get that help. And then now, because there is no handbook for stroke, it's not like you can get a, you know, a user's guide. You may have difficulty interacting or interfacing between your general practitioner and your speech and language therapist, your speech and language therapist to a psychologist, a psychologist to a neuropsychologist, you know, and, and trying to get everyone on the same page at the same time. And then again, in my experience, my, my general practitioner I had immediately around the time of my stroke, he was clueless. There were things that I needed done. He had no idea how to facilitate that. So I had to do all the research. I had to go to him and basically goes, here's how you do it. Goes, I'm not sure about that. And I'm like, I am, because I've done the research. Here's the number, call this person, you know? So that is, you know, sometimes that gets put on you. And depending on how difficult or how severe your communication deficits are, that'll be pushed on to your loved ones and specifically your spouse, right? The, the person that you share your day, nights, evenings, meals with. Um, cold feet on body too, you know. So there's various studies. There's one document that's a 14 page PDF. And there are some studies that, you know, caregivers can end up having poor physical health because of they're not taking the time for themselves, you know, they, because they have to invest so much of themselves, uh, invest so much of their time and their energy. Now their physical health now starts to slowly unwind. Uh, three studies looked at poor mental health uh, from persons helping those with aphasia, specifically aphasia, um, and they ended up having things like emotional distress and depression, right? You know, you could have, you could conceivably, um, as a caregiver of someone with a communication deficit after a stroke, you could end up with PTSD. You could end up with an anxiety order, disorder. You could have a, like a, a social anxiety disorder. You could have depression. Um, there are, you know, just the, the realm of the things. Excuse me while I reorganize Crash. Yes, he's in a bit of a mood today. So there's a lot of mental health issues. Um, another study looked at poor perceived health, right? You might be in good health. But do you see yourself as not being in good health? So that's kind of a little bit of a physical health issue and a little bit of a mental health issue. You're kind of, what's up with you today? Um, unfortunately, he's not so good with his words. Uh, another study looked at caregivers that had both poor mental and physical health. So is it your mental health that is now feeding into your physical condition or is it your physical condition now feeding into your mental health? Either way, you're going to start this um, this sort of burning the candle at both ends and it's just going to revolve around itself and, and eventually either your mental health is going to drastically impact your physical health or your physical health is going to drastically impact your uh, mental health and that just doesn't help anyone. So um, now all of these are influenced by the severity of the stroke or brain injury concussion, right? So obviously the more severe your loved one is impacted by their stroke, the more severe their communication deficits more are likely to be. Um, or you could have a fairly reasonable physical outcome, but again, you could have a drastic communications outcome. So again, your loved one is able to walk and move around and, and navigate through the world. When it comes to language, all bets are off. That would be, distressing I couldn't even imagine being that person that that would be like I know the days when I'm having difficulty just you know trying to get the right loaf of bread in a supermarket that can be difficult right and then another study looked at um, the relationship between caregiver burden or stress and the lack of social involvement so again you need to take time for you you've got to find outlets outside of your home outside of the stroke outside of the aphasia, right? You can't make everything about the stroke and everything about aphasia. You need your own outlet as a caregiver. So this is like the video last week. You can be selfish. There's nothing wrong with being a little bit selfish. So I, I'm going to list all the resources below. There was a uh, one from the the re, uh, from a rehabilitation um, uh, nursing 
uh, document. There's another one about reducing the, the psychosocial impact of aphasia. And there's something that's known as aphasia accent, action success knowledge or aphasia ASK program. Um, an aphasia ASK program, uh, it's relatively newish, right? Um, and it, it's a program that looks at how to help people with aphasia, give them strategies to use um, early intervention. And one of the big things I always talk about with the person that's had the stroke is when you have a change in state of care right now, that is either a change in location or a change in ability, right? So you, obviously the big change in location would be hospital to home. Uh, change in ability would be, you know, you're just learning how to talk again, learning how to walk again, getting ready to go back to work again. There's so many changes in state of ability. Just like I say, the stroke survivor or brain injury survivor themselves should look into therapy, right? going and seeing a therapist. The loved ones, specifically the spouses, husband, wife, whatever you call yourself is completely irrelevant, right? Whatever, whatever is going on in your household that is impacting the entire household, you're left to pick up the majority of those pieces at times. You need therapy yourself, be that um, uh, formal, be that informal, be that in a group setting, be that in um, individual counseling, you know, and, and again, how you access that will be regionally specific to you. Uh, if you live in Ontario, I'm in Canada, so we have that there, social life medicines. Um, you may be able to get that through your family doctor somehow. You may be able to go through like your employment um, uh, resort, like your EAP resources at work. Or you may be able to do that through um, like uh, your church, your, your synagogue, temple, mosque, what have you. But again, you want to see someone who's a, a duly qualified therapist that has experience specifically working with stroke um, survivors and the families they're in. Because you don't want someone that isn't very familiar dealing with some of the very difficult topics that are going to come up because of a stroke and communication deficits because of a stroke. Uh, you may look at organizations like your local March of Dimes or your Stroke Association or um, Heart and Stroke Association. They may be able to, or your local, um, maybe like an aphasia organization, they may be able to point you in the right direction as well of, of therapists, groups or settings that can help with that. So we always talk about or there's a lot, of, a lot of the conversations about the actual person who's had the injury, the actual person who's had the stroke, uh, you know, the, and what can be done or what should be done for them. Unfortunately, in many instances, we overlook the obvious, right? Because these things don't happen in a vacuum, right? We need to look at the stroke survivor and their immediate live-in support, right? Uh, and at that point, you need to just make sure that so you're not doing anything that is significantly negatively impacting in your world. You as the spouse, the caregiver, the friends, you need to make sure that if things look like they're getting dire, you need to go and get help. I'm just going to say be proactive and preemptive about it. Go get the help early. Like it, it couldn't hurt anyone. And then you've already got a relationship established. For when things do so, start to go sideways or start to go significantly south, you don't have to worry about finding someone you're comfortable with and, and developing that relationship and getting to know how that therapist works and make sure it works for you. So on that note, if you happen to know someone, um, or if you've been liking what you've been watching for almost 20 months, please uh, like, share, subscribe. You know, if this is a good video for you, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below. If you happen to know someone that's either immediately going through uh, the recovery from a stroke, a brain injury, uh, a concussion, is going through some form of communication deficit uh, after said event, or again, in this case, a loved one of someone, a spouse of someone that is helping someone through a communication deficit after a stroke, a brain injury, um, concussion, please point the channel up to them. They'll definitely get some value out of the content that I generate. You can get in contact with me on Twitter, or Instagram, just search Stroke Assaulter. Uh, you can reach me by email at strokeassaulter at gmail.com. If there's something you'd like to see me do a topic about, uh, please uh, put it down in the comments down below. And I will, last Friday, unfortunately, things came up and I didn't get to it. 
this Friday, I definitely will get to the questions and we'll just go forward from there. And if you happen to see someone who looks like they're going through, and this includes yourself, someone who looks like they may be having a stroke, someone that has uh, lost their sense of balance, they immediately uh, uh, appear befuddled or confused. They're having vision problems. They can't see out of one eye. They can only see in grayscale. They see a little dot in the world. Uh, they have a facial droop. There's a noticeable visual slackening of the facial muscles. Uh, they can't raise both arms equally effectively or at all. They can't smile equally effectively or at all. They have slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate uh, language for situation or context. You can't understand speech, right? Inability to stand on aided general body weakness or weakness on one side. Please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.